Look at you, Blondie. What'd you do? I read that you're not supposed to ask that. You read that? Well, you studied for prison? We don't initially learn what sent these women to prison. We meet the people first, and then maybe we meet the crime, but not before we understand them. That's the beauty of the writing with the backstories. We get to see who these women were before they were in prison. And sometimes it surprises you. It's finding that balance between surprising and believable, so that when you see it, you're like, oh, that makes sense, but I never would have thought that. Even if they're a villain on the show, or if they make questionable choices, or they do horrible things, most of the stories are our attempt to find that core of humanity in everybody. I still want to believe in all of this stuff. Isn't it sad? Oh, no. I think that's brave. Going into season two, we all, like, got together and we were like, oh my god, now there's pressure. Before we were like the new kids on the block, now everybody is so invested, they feel like these characters are their characters, and we wanted to make sure we did them right. I think we have a pretty good sense now of not only who we as the writers are interested in, but also who the audience is interested in. So for season two, I think we came in and made a list, actually, of the characters that we really haven't seen yet. I think there are the people that we knew all along what their backstory was, like Crazy Eyes, right from the beginning. We thought this is this person's story. Hello, Grace. I'm your best friend and your big sister. We certainly had an idea of where we were going. You know, we saw a flash of her parents in season one. There was this really fun, surprising moment where her parents are white. But we talked a lot about someone who grows up feeling so grossly different from their surroundings. And what does that kind of alienation do to someone? I'll be damned if I label my child less than so that the rest of the world can put her in a box and dismiss her before she's had a chance to succeed in life. I'm sure she'll have a great time tonight. Before Litchfield, life for Suzanne was quite different than I think a lot of us were expecting her life to be like. The thing that seems consistent about Suzanne's life is that she's always been a little bit out of place, just always stood just outside the circle in the group. Please don't be weird. I'm not weird. I'm just like everyone else. It's such a universal story, this feeling of her parents needing her to be something that she can't be and not being able to satisfy them and make them proud of her and the path that that can take you down. When I read Suzanne's backstory, I said to myself, ah, now it all makes sense. Now I get who this woman is and how desperately she has been seeking love. And that was where I led from coming through season two. I got you something special from the commissary. We can play later, you and me. It really made me want to fight for her even harder to, to get that validation, to find that place for herself. And we understand her a little bit better. Even if the details on the surface are weird or extreme to like the average person, the, you know, everyone is driven by the same things. So even with somebody like Black Cindy, we try to sort of give her an emotional truth. Do you have kids? No. Nope. Thanks. We learned that she has a daughter that she does not acknowledge. We find out she works as a TSA agent, and she's able to facilitate contraband very fluidly <laughs> in, um, at, at her job. Happy birthday, baby. I remember finishing reading that episode thinking, why doesn't she acknowledge her daughter as her daughter? Why is she her? sister. It's really interesting and complex to see that and how she uses humor to sort of mask a lot of uh, the difficult areas in her life. You're funny, aren't you? Always joking, always clowning. <laughs> we can't laugh in here. What else we got? Some of the things that affected my performance, learning her backstory, was the relationship that she had with her mother. You gonna pick her up every day from school, sit up at nights when she's sick? Clean up her vomit down on your hands and knees. What, you don't think I can do that shit? You take her then. If you think you can do a better job of raising her than me, be my guest. Take her. Go. I had never experienced Cindy get that angry. And we see how that plays out when she confronts V and sort of how that maternal authority causes her to react aggressively. I ain't scared of you. Hmm. 
In theater, it's different in that you get the beginning, middle, and end of, of the story, whereas in Litchfield and as for Black Cindy, her story is still unfolding. It's about trusting the writers, trusting the vision that they have, um, and fully committing to whatever you're given. <laughs> oh, you know me. I got so much to say about love. <laughs> You know, that was never a master plan that Lorna was going to be this secret stalker. And when I had to write that episode, I really went back and looked at a lot of her scenes. And the more that I watched her and the more I saw her talk about her fiance, I was like, this is something feels off. Like, this girl feels truly crazy. I think when you look at a character that is planning a wedding that far in advance and is so detached both physically and mentally from reality in, in a prison, you kind of have to ask what's going on here. He hasn't visited you since three weeks after you got here. That's not true. Oh, yeah, it is. And everybody knows it. The only reason nobody says anything is because they're embarrassed for you because it's pathetic. That was exciting to like see that in her character and go, oh my God, could this work? This kind of sixth sense surprise reveal that this person is actually, has invented this entire relationship and really lost her mind and is this hopeless romantic who is a lovable stalker. I remember shooting episode four and looking in the mirror uh, with that veil on and that being really painful. Oh, I'm getting a little teary just thinking about it. Um, yeah, that. I think it's it, it, it's a funny line when you're performing. It's not all pretend. It, it can be deeply painful, and I remember distinctly that moment, knowing that she'll never get that. You know that the way that she imagined it, it'll never happen that way. I'm a crazy person. There is something really wrong with me. There's something wrong with all of us. Like otherwise, we wouldn't be in here. The thing that I love about what she did with her performance is that you love her anyway and if you look at that on paper like this poor guy went on one date with her and she left a bomb under his car and stalked his fiance and is breaking into his house and you're rooting for her everybody knows what that's like to love someone and feel rejected and so there's a way of identifying with her despite how you know cringe worthy some of her behavior is how's wedding planning going rolled an off for a minute Weddings were bad luck for me. All my husbands died. I didn't know that. You never talk about your life. <laughs> Nobody cares. Well, Miss Rosa was always interesting to us because we really wanted to address the medical situation in prison and how frustrating that is and how arbitrary it is. And when we thought about her backstory, we thought, you know, there are criminals in prison that enjoy being criminals. And how fun to take this seemingly helpless old lady who's dying of cancer and have seen her be this person that like got off on robbing banks and had fun doing that. I'm gonna rob that bank. We just did one. Let's do one more. This is a woman who will take an opportunity and run with it. You see that with young Miss Rosa in season two, and ultimately with me. And Stephanie, who played Mini-Me, oh, brought that woman to life. I was delighted at her hottitude with the guys. But at least you're still alive. The curse never got you. I never did the after kiss. Maybe that's what saved me. I didn't realize how moved I myself would be with her. There's a scene in season two where I'm talking to my cellmate, Anita, and uh, I'm just back from chemo. And I thought that I was going to go out in a blaze of glory. And instead, her character was going to disappear. This slow, invisible, disappearing into nothing. It's terrifying. I nearly lost it. That, that day of shooting, that will stay with me. I'm gonna have to write you a shot. You give a shot to a nun? Don't hate me. I've never gotten a shot before. It's the end of days. 
It was more obvious what we had to write for our nun, Sister Jane, because she'd spoken about breaking into a nuclear facility. What's that? When Sister Patricia was protesting the Portsmouth plant, she threw a pint of blood. So what? The pictures will look spectacular. Well, hers was a journey probably founded around Vatican II, and there was a great transformation in the Catholic Church at the time. Focus not on what Christ may do for you, but on what you can do for Christ. Thank you, Sister Kennedy. Constance. There is a, a large population of rebel nuns. Many of them have been excommunicated and are no longer supported by the Vatican in any way, which is a fascinating sort of backstory for Sister Jane. Learning that I was not a sister, I was not religious. That was the big, oh my God, moment. It's not about service to God, it's about you. That's not true. You timed this protest to coincide with your book release. It was quite surprising, especially the part about the book and the narcissism. I was always very ladylike in season one, and I was afraid that maybe season two wouldn't match up with what I had done. But then I was reminded of the fact that I was actually deceiving everyone in the prison. I was pretending that I still was a nun. They told me that they'd reconsider letting me back in the church if I showed contrition in prison, but bad habits die hard. People have different identities for different occasions. And I think with Orange and with our backstories, we have a chance to show that everyone has different masks and different personas, which are all survival strategies. I think we play a lot with that, with our characters, in terms of what has happened to them in their lives outside of prison. What would they be running away from? What would they be eager to shed? I think Glory is a good example of that. Don't you think your kitchen worker should have a sanitary place to go? Especially since they're the ones taking the crust off your sandwiches? Gloria Mendoza, prior to coming to Litchfield, was a single mother struggling to make ends meet, working with her aunt in a bodega, running a little welfare scheme, food stamp scheme, and ends up, you know, falling in love with a man who abuses her. She seems like such a strong, domineering presence in the prison, and we thought it would be interesting to show that, you know, someone who carries herself like that also can be a victim of abuse in her private life. That was a shock. I remember having to put down the script and take a breather and go, wow, they're going there, and they're going there with Gloria. This is going to be interesting. And I also felt a huge responsibility because now you're like, okay, someone is going to be touched by this. I grew up in the Bronx, in New York City, where a lot of the women um, that I knew were single moms, and they were strong, and they were scary in many ways because they were so tough, but they were really good people. They were survivors. Gloria came from them. So when I read her story, I was like, wow, this is not far-fetched. As much as she's a victim of abuse, she's also a fighter. So that's what I love about, you know, this role, Gloria. I think it's interesting to explore what happens to women without men. And someone like Gloria, who was pretty weak and submissive in the face of her abuse, gets into prison and finds her power and really finds herself in charge. By no means am I like rooting for prison or that experience, but I think the all-female society aspect of it is super interesting. You really have to admire the way these women find meaning in their days, how they take care of each other. I've just never been a part of something where so many women were being portrayed in such dimensional ways. Women who are so flawed, trying to make it through life and trying to figure it out just like everybody else. There are no stereotypes, and it shows that anyone could fall into a situation as these women. One false move, being at the wrong place at the wrong time, associating yourself with the wrong person can have you locked up. I think the word criminal is so often associated with villain, and these women aren't villains. These are women that all of us would know, and that's how they capture our hearts, because 
it's so human to make a bad choice. You got one fucked up perspective on the world, kid. I guess that's why I gotta be locked up. No. That's what makes you great.